All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'd like to uh, first uh, thank uh, Andes for inviting me here. It's, I haven't been to Asia since uh, 2019, so it's definitely great to be back. My name is Ted Spears. I'm a technical fellow at Microchips FPJ Business Unit. I've also served on the RIS-5 Board of Directors for, uh, for its first, year, first eight years of existence. My talk today is the golden age of computer architecture with uh, Microchip and RIS-5. Didn't get training on this thing. Pointed the wrong way. All right, so I'm going to talk about a lot of things. Uh, hopefully, I get get through it. Uh, RISC V. Uh, explain how RISC V fits in the ecosystem. A lot of people have kind of talked about it, and then look back at the golden age of computer architecture. So this is actually a lecture given by Dave Patterson, which really meant a lot to me, and I think uh, set a framework for the future that we can all look to look to as kind of a roadmap maybe for a, for us all. So I'll make some. Uh, uh, projections using that golden age framework. Talk briefly on RISC-V vector processing. I've made a, a big bet on RISC-V vectors. We heard a lot about it today. I think it's promising. And then, you know, a little bit about Microchip's uh, leadership in uh, technical innovation. We really are uh, putting a lot of skin in the game here in RISC-V, and you'll, you'll, I think you'll be impressed by some of the things we've been doing. And then finally, uh, you know, RISC-V is going to be the galactic standard ISA. We're not just talking about the Earth here. So, um, so basically, this, this slide shows how, how I view the ecosystem. You can have closed or proprietary and uh, open. And then you have the software ecosystem on the top, and then the hardware implementation at the bottom. Uh, and the ISA is the contract between the uh, hardware and the software. And we all know the whole PC era was, was completely uh, proprietary, Windows, Intel, AMD. So, so Intel controlled the uh, ISA, and they also controlled the SOC. So you could only get the SOCs from Intel and AMD. ARM uh, made an ISA, also a proprietary ISA. But what they did different is said, well, let's, let's sell an IP. So now what that enabled is lots of people could make implementations uh, with the ARM ISA. So that was an important uh, innovation that fueled the cell phone age. So over uh, here on the open side, we obviously open source software, that history has been written. It's a huge success. And then RISC-V here is an open instruction set. Uh, I think uh, you know, that's a huge set. There's been other open instruction sets, but RISC-V is dominant. But now what's different here is many people can make an implementation of the RISC-V ISA. It could be proprietary implementations such as NVIDIA, open source implementations or uh, uh, pro other proprietary implementations like Andes and sci 5 offers. And then, just like ARM, a lot of people can make RISC-V SOCs. But so the magic here with RISC-V, what's different uh, today versus ARM, uh, the ARM days, is you have a lot of people who can could make uh, RISC-V IP implementations. So as the market quick, changes quickly, the whole marketplace can respond and, and, and target you know, various uh, uh, workloads and so forth. So this, this is really important to, to RISC-V. So uh, now switching over to the Golden Age framework. Uh, this is a Turing Lecture uh, Award. So Patterson and Hennessy won the Turing Prize in 2017. Uh, Turing Prize is like the Nobel Prize for, for computer architecture. And they, their talk was a new Golden Age for computer architecture. And they talked about four things and I'm going to kind of focus on two of them here. They talked about domain-specific hardware, co-design, and also open instruction sets. As these are kind of the pillars of, of the golden age. And then they use this slide here, uh, uh, basically you know, showing Python at the top running at a speed of one, and then Intel AVX instructions running 60,000 times faster. And they call that a domain-specific hardware. Uh, and so as you move... Uh, down here, the hardware is getting more productive, uh, and, but as you move up, the software is getting more productive. It's much more quick, much easier for a developer to use Python than to develop in C, and then it's you know, very, very unproductive to write microcode for, for AVX. So then they talked about, uh, in addition to domain-specific hardware, domain-specific languages at the top, so that's even one layer higher. These domain-specific languages 
uh, help you in one domain, and they can be built on uh, either uh, interpreted or uh, 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 compiled languages. And so TensorFlow was, was the domain-specific language that was really popular at the time for AI. Is actually written in Python, but as Barna pointed out, Python is actually implemented in C. So in 2019, I said, this is great. So this provides a roadmap. So I did this talk. I said, you know, we got we to gotta span this. We got to connect the domain-specific uh, languages with the domain-specific architectures. And I said, what is needed? Open hardware standards, more investment in hardware startups, more hardware engineers, make hardware cool again is a tool term I used. How are we doing? Well, RISC-V is doing great, uh, uh, and we have our own vector extensions, uh, which are comparable to the AVX. More investment in startups, a lot of startups here. Uh, I don't think you can start a, have a startup today that's ARM-based. Startups have to be RISC-V-based. Make hardware cool again. I uh, think we're getting there uh, for sure. I uh, think uh, and the stock market performance, hardware companies are outperforming uh, software companies now, so hardware is definitely cool. At the top, I said, keep doing what you're doing. There was no problem with innovation at this level. In fact, I think PyTorch has supplanted TensorFlow in this particular aspect. And then I said, more focus on compiler technology. I had no idea what that meant, uh, but this, this is really what, what fills the gap, right? Then, sure enough, 20, 2021, the golden age of compilers, uh, Chris Latner uh, made this talk, uh, and he talked about... Uh, we need to compile to these DSAs. We need to enable all these domain-specific architectures, but we need software to be able to target these heterogeneous compute uh, uh, platforms very quick, very easily. So he talked about MLIR, so I think that was referenced today in the, uh, the Andy's talk. So it's multi-level intermediate representation, and this is Chris's hope. This is the answer. This is the golden age compilers, this, this enables people to write compilers to target uh, heterogeneous hardware. So, the recipe of the future, more focus on compiler technology, and MLIR stepped in, uh, and I think answered that question, obviously other ones are there, but I, I think uh, you know, this is the golden age of compilers was filled by MLIR. So Chris, I don't want to be doing too much of an advertisement for him, but now he has this language called Mojo. Does it complete the puzzle? So Mojo's designed to uh, s uh, uh, solve a variety of hardware AI development problems, and it's the first language that's developed on MLIR, so he's eating his dog food. And then it's, it's Python. It's a superset of Python. So, uh, you know, we have, have a similar chart, so they accelerate from Python, something written in Python, you can add types, vectorize, all these are Mojo capabilities. Uh, and you can get a 455,000x acceleration of, ma of MATMOL using Python targeting a specific uh, architecture. So if I look at this uh, future, we got the DSLs at the top, uh, and then we got uh, DSAs, the most specific architecture at the bottom, and I get to separate out RISC-V powered DSAs. I think this is what the world we all want. And uh, uh, basically, we have Mojo, is uh, inherited from uh, 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 Python. So we kind of got this path now. DSAs, DSLs can be written in Mojo, which then can be compiled to, DS, uh, to, to anyone's uh, DSA. So this is a possible... At the end of the day, software is going to be the answer to uh, uh, how all this innovation get, gets enabled. And this is one example that I... One future I see is possible with this golden age. So what about vectors? So DSAs uh, are, are being built. There's a lot of startups being, building DSAs. Uh, and <laughs> everywhere you look, there's vector processors. So Cerebris, uh, Graphcore, Xilinx, or AMD, Esperanto, Meta, Tense, Torrent are all building these giant uh, arrays of vector processors. And th these ones at the bottom uh, here are, are RISC-V powered DSAs. So this is the story we want, want to continue to write. We want innovation here, and we want it to be RISC-V based. So, uh, I, just about, you know, briefly on RISC-V uh, uh, vectors, you know, kind of the way I like to look at it, is it's a very simple ISA, it's easy to understand, so this 
basically you know, add two vectors together in, in uh, registers two and zero and, and put the destination vector four, so uh, de uh, register four. Simple ISA, but optimizable hardware. You can optimize for your application. You can optimize the, the VLAN, the length of the registers, uh, depending on your power performance, and you can also uh, optimize the ALU for the same thing, for power and performance. But you can get, uh, you know, one binary targeting all these uh, architectures, and because there's a lot of flexibility on the way the uh, register file is interpreted, you can actually control the state, uh, uh, you know, how the software is viewing this, 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 all this hardware. So it's a really uh, powerful uh, vector ISA. So microchip uh, switching now, extending the reach of uh, of, of RISC five. So. Uh, we, in the 2016 summit, we introduced a soft IP, RISC-V soft, and so this is a program, an IP, the RISC-V uh, core that runs in a uh, uh, FPGA. And then in 2019, we announced a, a SOC FPGA. So we make a part, product called PolarFire SOC, which is a quad-core RISC-V application processor and a, and a monitor core. Uh, attached to our low power secure uh, polar fire uh, FPGA. And then we have an ecosystem we call the RIS 5 or MI5 is our RIS 5 ecosystem. So we're like one of the first companies that made products that the, the user can actually program. We're not deeply embedded at all. And then in 2022, we announced Polar Fire 2, which is going to be RIS 5 enabled, but we also announced uh, something called HPSC, which is the high performance space computer. So, a little bit about this. The details started coming out on this uh, at the Space Computing Conference uh, earlier this year. But at the heart of it is uh, eight core, 64 bit RIS 5 vector processor uh, 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 being, being created for, you know, with, as a contract under NASA to basically dominate the space market. So, uh, a lot of work, there's hardware, but we're doing a whole you know, My5 ecosystem being expanded to support a, a vertical. So, we're like, we're the first company to show how to take RISC-V and, and, and to own a vertical. So, you know, a lot of applications across the top, and, you know, my belief is space is important for space, but it's also all the needs in space, low power, security, uh, uh, you know, high density compute, all applies to the edge, so it's gonna be applicable in other markets as well. So a lot of work on the software, uh, so we have an existing customer, uh, has a lot of needs, and we're, we're building the silicon and the ecosystem, and RISC-V is at the core for, for space market. So, you know, really, uh, I want to connect a few things. So NASA basically had these requirements, more compute, more, more AI, more IO bandwidth, red hard tolerance, cybersecurity, uh, and they wanted open standards. So NASA was tired of having their own proprietary stuff. So we can solve that problem with RISC-V. And, but, you know, NASA's there with missions to Mars and so forth, but there's a huge uh, commercial space market that, that's developing as well. So... Uh, I'm a big believer, I mean, I saw RISC-V early, but I've actually been a big believer that uh, what matters in space is going to matter on the ground or vice versa. NASA technology in the, in the 60s, I think it's going to, space is going to drive the technology going forward. You may not know it, but uh, your company is going to have to have a straight space strategy sometime. So uh, I did this uh, keynote in uh, 20. 21, and I, and I said, you know, RISC-V is going to become the galactic standard uh, for ISA. So this is even before HP existed, and we're well on our way to, you know, expanding beyond uh, the, the ground here. And, you know, what's going to enable that? Uh, this is uh, Starship from SpaceX. It's going to drive uh, launch costs you know, down, down to nothing. It's going to cost nothing to uh, uh, launch your uh, uh, payloads. And this is a huge thing. Uh, you know, shown there is a 747, uh, which is tiny compared to the Starship. So the roadmap to the next golden age, uh, you know, open and flexible ISA, you know, moving from ARM to open and flexible is, is going to be important. 
Uh, the ex expanded ecosystem is important. You can have lots of suppliers to solve your specific needs when you need to innovate. That's enabled, excuse me, by the RISC V uh, standard. And then, but more industries, uh, investments needed to uh, enable software to basically target all of this. So uh, I think that's the conclusion of my talk. Thank you.